we're looking at two more things we can learn from the periodic table here. We're looking at um, the number of valence electrons and the average atomic mass. First off, the valence electrons are no different than any other kind of electron in an atom. Okay, it just happens to be that they are farthest out in the atom. So, in this right model of the atom that I've drawn here, okay, carbon has a total of six electrons to match six protons, but we only end up with four of those farthest out in the electron cloud. That makes those available to do all the kinds of fun stuff, bonding, chemical reactions, you know, getting jostled around and releasing light, the important stuff that we actually care about. Okay, so. If we want to figure out how many valence electrons something is going to have to, uh, you know, do all the fun stuff with, uh, the kind of technical way of figuring out is a little bit extensive, it's a little bit exhausting, and it's not really all that useful to us in this class. So there is a shortcut instead that looks at what column that element is in. So, for instance, boron and aluminum and gallium and everything in column 13 has three valence electrons. We basically just scratch out the one of 13 and that leaves three, okay? So whether boron with five total electrons is involved in something or aluminum with 13 total electrons or gallium with 31, okay? They all act somewhat similarly because they all have the same number of valence electrons, okay? Even if aluminum has way more total electrons in the atom, you know, in this case, 13 versus boron's five, Okay, only three of those are farthest out in the atom to do anything important, okay, just like boron or just like gallium. So what matters more is how many electrons are farthest out, we call those valence electrons, and not how many total electrons something has. So that's going to be very important to us, okay, and the shortcut makes it a lot easier to figure out how many we have available to do something with. Column 14 becomes four as we scratch out the one here. So everything in column 14, carbon, silicon, germanium, all these guys in column 14 have four valence electrons. Everything in column 15, scratch out the one, has five valence electrons. Everything in column 16 has six valence electrons. Column 17 has seven valence electrons. And everything except helium in column 18 has eight valence electrons. Helium only has two valence electrons because it doesn't have enough electrons total to get to eight. We're stuck at two. Okay, if it makes you feel more comfortable, helium actually kind of belongs over here. So this is kind of helium's honorary spot, along with everything else in column two that has two valence electrons. Beryllium has two valence electrons, and magnesium has two valence electrons, and calcium has two valence electrons because they're all in the same column here. Okay, so whether we're dealing with beryllium with four total electrons or magnesium with 12 total electrons or calcium with 20 total electrons, they all have two valence electrons. And that's only determined by what column of the periodic table they're in. Okay, They all only have two electrons farthest out in the electron cloud that they can use for something interesting. Okay, And everything in column one has just one valence electron. Hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, uh, cesium is down there. All those guys only have one valence electron, okay? Now that may leave you wondering, what about these guys down here in the middle, okay? In the valley of the periodic table, we're gonna ignore these for now. We will talk about how you can figure out how many valence electrons those have to interact with other atoms and stuff. But for now, it's a little bit wonky, it's a little bit odd, so we're going to skip it, okay? So focus on columns one and two being one valence electron and two valence electrons. Okay, skip columns 3 through 12 and pick up with 13 being 3, 14 being 4, 15 being 5, 16 being 6, 17 being 7, and 18 being 8, except for helium, which has 2 on the other side. Okay, so that's valence electrons. The other part of this is the average atomic mass, okay, which basically tells us how heavy an element is, including all its isotopes. I've got here three versions of carbon, carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. And that mass number after the dash tells us about how heavy the atom is based on how many protons and neutrons it has in it. Okay, Carbon-12 has a total of 12 protons and neutrons together. Six of those are protons, the other six are neutrons. 
carbon-13 also has six protons, but since it has a mass number of 13, that means it has seven neutrons, okay, along with those six protons. And carbon-14 has six protons and eight neutrons, all right? To get a mass unit that was appropriate for the atom, we basically just made one, right, where each proton and each neutron is about the same mass, and each one is about one atomic mass unit, or we call that AMU. AMU stands for atomic mass unit. Okay, so carbon-12 with 12 protons and neutrons together has a mass of about 12 atomic mass units, or about 12 AMU. Carbon-13 has a mass of about 13 AMU. Carbon-14 has a mass of about 14 AMU. Makes it very easy, very simple. Now the issue is, if I go have a chunk of carbon in my lab and I want to do something with it chemically, well, some of it's going to be carbon-12, and some of it's going to be carbon-13, and some of it's going to be carbon-14. So how do I figure out the mass of the element as a whole? Well, I can't just say it's you know the most popular one. You know, Maybe carbon-12 is the most popular, and maybe it's the most likely version of carbon I'm going to find, but I can't just leave it like that and say, well, it's going to have a mass of about 12 AMU. That would leave out the mass of the heavier versions of carbon, which do play a part. And if I try and do calculations with just the mass of carbon-12, I'm not getting anywhere. It's going to end up with some bad results. Okay, I could do a typical average where I say, well, I've got carbon-12, I've got carbon-14. I'm going to add them up and divide by three, and I end up shooting for the middle Okay, when I get a mass of about 13. But that literally wouldn't work either because between those three isotopes, it's not an even split. Okay, if we had about you know 33.3% of each of these isotopes, then yeah, we could have you know something shoot for the middle because they're all about you know the same popularity. They're all about you know as common as each other, but it just doesn't happen like that for most isotopes. So instead, we do a special kind of average called the weighted average, okay, to get a number called the average atomic mass. Okay. So the average atomic mass for the element carbon, for all the different isotopes it has, carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14, takes into account not just how heavy they are, like carbon-12 having a mass of 12 AMU, but also how common or popular it is. Okay, Carbon-12 makes up about 99% of all carbon. Carbon-13 makes up about 1% of all carbon, and carbon-14 is basically nothing. It's like 0, 0.000, a whole bunch of times, a whole bunch of zeros, and then, you know, something, something, something. Okay? So based on this, if I want an average that reflects how popular or how common these isotopes are, and therefore represents the element as a whole, I have an average that is weighted towards the side of the, L, of the isotope that is more common. So I end up shifting this over to the left side towards the more popular isotope because the average is way down towards that side. That's why we call it a weighted average. Okay. Now, again, long story short, that number is already there for us on the periodic table. And it's this decimal number we've kind of been avoiding up to this point. Okay. This is the average atomic mass, that weighted average for an element. And it takes into account all the different isotopes that make up that element. So Boron has an average atomic mass of 10.81. Okay, that doesn't mean that I just have one specific version of boron and its mass is 10.81 exactly. It means I've got different versions of boron floating around out there. And based on the different versions and how common they are and how heavy they are, okay, we end up with a special weighted average of those isotopes that best represent the element as a whole. So no matter which element or uh, which um you know, atom of boron I end up with, I don't care. I'm going to have so many atoms, it's all mixed in together. But the mass of the element as a whole is going to be about 10.81 atomic mass units. Okay, so that's the average atomic mass. That's what you're looking for. And all it is is just a special kind of average that tells us the mass of the element based on the isotopes that make it up.